So welcome everyone uh, to our last and fantastic le lecture for today. So before I uh, be uh, introduce our distinguished visitor, I'm just going to start with our land acknowledgement. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So it's my distinct pleasure to uh, be able to introduce our distinguished visitor for today, Dr. Emily Kid White. She's an assistant professor at Osgoode Hall Law School at York University. Her areas of teaching and research specialization are in legal and political philosophy, constitutional law, and public international law. Dr. Kit White completed her doctoral studies at New York University School of Law as a Trudeau Foundation Scholar, having previously graduated from the LLM program in International Legal Studies with the Jerome Lipper Prize for Distinction. She holds a JD from the Faculty of Law at Queen's University. Dr. Kit White is an emerging scholar in the field of law and emotions, holding an extensive international interdisciplinary network on the subject. Her manuscript on judicial emotions is under contract with uh, Oxford University Press. Is that still current? Is it? Uh, yes. Okay. It's just on its way out. Awesome. And related to the theme of law and emotions, her talk today is titled "Images of Reach, Range, and Recognition on Emotions in the Study of Law." So we're uh, very privileged to have someone who's a scholar in this uh, area, and who can now share with us, especially those of us who are teaching and who are learning about law and how this plays a role. So thank you very much for coming, and please welcome and enjoy it. Thank you so much, Amar. I'm so glad to be here. This is my first time at Robson Hall, and I'm really loving the building and the light. Uh, so I can't wait to look into some of the other classrooms where I understand there's wonderful art as well. So thank you for this invitation, Amar, and thank you all so much for coming today. I'm really looking forward to this time together, speaking about one of my most favorite subjects on law and emotion. And I'm really looking forward to learning a little bit about what you're interested in uh, during our Q&A as well. So I've been researching and writing in the field of law and emotions for well over a decade now. And in terms of my own methods, I'm a legal philosopher, really actually a political philosopher who's interested in questions raised by the existence and the practice of law. Bernard Williams defined the analytical philosophical style as one that involves arguments, distinctions, and plain speech. And my work is in that style. Though I'm keenly aware that it is hotly out of fashion to be a legal philosopher right now, and I think for good reason, when the work is open to the criticism that it is a contextual or a historical or little more than elegantly organized prejudice in the words of the philosopher R.M. Hare. It's rightly out of fashion when we see how the methods of ideal theory abstract away concerns over the coercive apparatus of the state or as the recently passed political philosopher Charles Mills put it in his book, The Racial Contract, where it abstracts away the injustices of the past. More specifically in the terrain of law, we have the writings of Des Manderson, Naz Modirzadeh, Dina Suvala, Robert Knox, and Thorin Raj, who through their own work, show how the self-stylized technical and professionalized form and style of legal scholarship and writing is not just removed, stayed, dry, and gripless in the day-to-day. -day. It is cover for a pernicious and at times brutal and totalizing politics of extraction, exclusion, dispossession, and structured inequality. So it is important to me, via method, to work in ways that see these charges clearly. And that's one of the reasons why, for those starting out in the area of law and emotions, I often recommend a piece by the legal philosopher Amiya Srinivasan entitled On the Aptness of Anger, which uses the techniques of legal philosophy to unpack the political understanding of anger by noticing who has long been off page 
in understanding the emotion, by historically situating the emotion, and by recentering the work of black feminists like Audre Lorde, who, like Aristotle before her, championed anger as a form of right seeing. So in today's lecture, I wish to pursue the question of how we might put the philosophical study of emotion to work in the critical appraisal of law. As Ronald D'Souza, the philosopher once wrote, emotions are a philosophical hub and their study leads us into questions of epistemology, ontology, logical form, philosophical psychology and ethics. And I wanted to bring these sorts of questions and lines of pursuit into conversations within the field of law, where there is a tendency to assume that it's either possible to extricate emotions from legal reasoning and arguments about law's authority, or to rest on uncomplicated and wholly demystified assumptions about the legibility of emotions over time and place. So I think it's probably time for a definition. Well, most philosophical conceptions of emotions hold that emotions have cognitive and affective aspects and also characteristic desires for emotion. So we can think the emotion of shame and one of the characteristic desires of shame is to shrink or disappear, it feels hot, uh, as part of its affect. Now, while some psychologists and biologists have uh, suggested that there's something like a universal structure for at least a few core emotions, many, if not all, emotions contain evaluative judgments. And as such, they strike us as subjectively involved and image-laden engagements with the world, to quote Robert Solomon's famous phrase. Where evaluative judgments are embedded within the structure of an emotion, we can be expected to be scripted, at least to an extent, by time and place, and shaped by political and material realities, and be prone to drawing on idiom, norms, caches of images, binaries, myths, etc. with all of this extending even into our physiological descriptions of emotions around here. So at some times and places we say something like, when I'm anxious, I have butterflies in my stomach. Okay. So all of these experiences of emotions belong uh, also to times and places. As Philip Larkin wrote, what scaffolded mind can rebuild experience? And so, with the glo poet's glorious and brutal expediency, I think he says enough here in a line to emphasize what I'm trying to get at, which is the socially constructed nature of at least some elements of some emotions. So beginning here, we can see questions of all sorts concerning the reach of emotions arise questions about our abilities to recognize the emotions of others, or even those emotions belonging to the self sometimes, including the emotions of others outside our own political spheres or historical period. So an outline for today's talk. In our time together, I'm hoping to maybe lay two main tracks. And I'd like to begin by setting out four main scripts or sets of reasons why I think it's interesting, important, maybe even necessary to study emotions in law. And once these have been established, I'd like to raise two broad sets of questions <coughs> about emotions. A series of questions about reach and capture, and a series of philosophical questions about range and recognition. I'm going to say a little bit more later on what I mean by those terms. So the first script, law on the ground. <clears throat> the study of emotions stands to offer a deeper sense of the impact of law, which is so often experienced or born far from legislatures, far from courts deciding questions, far from administrative decision makers. Studying the emotions that appear integral, epiphenomenal, aberrant, or even disruptive to the human practices that constitute law 
can assist us in developing a more critical understanding of those practices. And so too, the ways in which they work to support or undermine the principles and norms of application they profess. As illustrated by the work of Re uh, Rebecca Sutton in a recently published book, who, which examines emotions in the context of international humanitarian law workers, the study of emotions can provide highly detailed and granular layered portraits of legal practice. Conceptualizations and explanations about practical activity, motivation and intention all implicate emotions. And so the study of emotion stands to broaden and even complicate at times our understanding of legal actors and what they do when they apply the law. When studying how legal officials are applying the law at the international or domestic level, we might think it's important to know something about the impact of emotions on perceptions and bias. For example, the possibilities and the politics of empathy. We might need to know something about the effects of enmity and anger on legal reasoning. And increasingly important, the consequences of apathy or emotional burnout in judicial practice. Scholars interested in the impact of particular legal regimes or in political change, historical contingency, or progress and decline narratives might also wish to study emotions for their motivational aspects, for the way in which they interact with our political attention, how they can pull our eyes towards or obscure altogether the impact of a particular legal regime. Some emotions precipitate or compound an inability to pay quality attention to other persons, while other emotions play indispensable roles in holding attention on a subject. We might also query whether there are any emotions which spur on lawmaking efforts. For example, hope, rage, horror, or oblivion. Maria Pialera, the Mexican feminist writer, for example, argues that aesthetic performances such as narratives or protests are much more successful than reasoned dialogue in inspiring new and broader conceptions of justice. Last, the study of emotion seems relevant for research that examines the impact of immaterial forces, such as the mood or the zeitgeist of an age or an era. Political crises, for example, often to seem to suggest something like an emotional high pitch or an everything is illuminated visceral sense of certain stakes, which might be revealing, illusory, or entirely obscuring of other less visceral or attention grabbing instances of structured political violence, such as environmental degradation, which sometimes, but not always, works slowly. So that's our first script, thinking about law on the ground, that traditional law and society framing. The next has to do with legal reasoning. So research into the forms and practices of legal reasoning and interpretation are similarly enriched by the study of emotion. It is evident, for example, that certain legal texts sometimes involve emotion words. We sometimes look for remorse in sentencing. We sometimes look for what the hate is or how to define hate in hate speech. We also have evaluative legal terms that we draw on all the time, which appear to have an effective resonance. Dignity, freedom, equality are all part of our constitutional jurisprudence. Alternatively, one might be interested in the emotional aspects of the materials that form part of the legal judgments that are embedded within or invoked by the text of the judgment, i.e. the resuscitation of the facts, the woven in metaphors, the use of past cases as analogies, the use of hypotheticals and exemplars that are meant to bring up some kind of resonance of an example that is applicable, and the judgment's overall style or lack thereof. 
One might also wish to focus on the emotional aspects of the evidence or the testimony that forms part of the legal record and how these, perhaps even alongside the performances of the legal actors or even the aesthetics of the legal room or the courthouse, how these uh, seem to determine something about uh, the law's impact. It might also seem to be important to question how the law may or may not be able to bear witness to some emotional materials. One significant site for explanation lies in the emotions of claimants themselves, reacting to what they see as the violence of state action and to what their lawyers might frame as a rights violation. And this could be in ways uh, this transformation of a claimant's story into legal arguments can it sometimes be empowering or sometimes debilitating, where the conservative nature of precedent doesn't seem able to capture the harm in question or ultimately seems unable to offer remedy, peace, or solace. Uh, this is sort of a favorite one of mine as well. A third script for studying emotions in the law. Now, a distinct set of reasons to study in the uh, emotions in the law concerns the search for a common or at least solid structure of human experience or human nature with which to establish a ground for critiquing political arrangements. In the history of liberal legal philosophy, Emotions have long been a potential ground for constructing a theory of human nature, which serves as a foundation for constructing arguments about legitimate political authority. We can think here of Thomas Hobbes, for example, building a whole political system out of this idea that we share a common fear of death and a desire for commodious living. Or we can think of David Hume, who grounded all ethical activity in the shared sentiment of beneficence to argue in something akin to the first critical genealogy that justice was an artificial virtue that developed over time via the commingling of an ingrained sense of justice and a series of historically contingent community practices surrounding property. Or, one might think of Robin West writing in the 1989 Yale Journal of Law and Feminism, who wrote, we should scrap much of everything to do with the existing legal system and begin again by constructing a feminist legal theory sourced directly from the emotions of rage and love. Normative <laughs> arguments in legal and political thinking regularly smuggle into their premises conceptions of human nature or human personality. And studying the assumptions at play about emotions in an argument about the authority of law can further the critical work of unpacking these often unspoken arguments that are doing so much work in founding uh, the conclusions that follow. Human nature arguments can run in various directions, claiming, for example, that certain political arrangements are necessary to enable or support human security or human flourishing or to cure certain hardwired ills in human nature or to prevent distortions in human personality. This is an old model of political argumentation that I suggest has never left us. And we've seen explicit renewal in invocations of international human rights and post-Second World War, within post-Second World War constitutions that invoke the language of human dignity. Probing the conception of emotion embedded within a theory about political authority or legitimacy about government activities can expose the broader working account of human nature. Set to light, such accounts can sometimes be accepted or need to be modified or rejected at a wholesale level. The final script 
to go through today a whole different set of reasons for maybe thinking about why you want to study emotion in law. Envisions the study of emotions in law as reflecting an interest in sensibility, style, aesthetics, or phenomenology, with proponents working through the ways in which emotions are shaped, are mutually constituted by political culture, by law, history, and language, or deeper material realities or political economies. Work here might detail the emotional sensibility already demanded by the laws that are in force in a particular place, even if that sensibility seems to be a cold, sterile, clinical one. By describing it, or analyzing it, or historicizing it, or by drawing attention to its material base. So for example, a great law and emotion scholar, Hilla Kieran, writes about the neoliberal emotions that are recognizable within tort law, and little else, she argues. <clears throat> in the alternative, work in this area might focus on establishing, coaxing out, rediscovering, giving due regard to those sensibilities which have been historically marginalized, constructing an alternative political sensibility of solidarity, for example, as a form of reaction or resistance. Here we might think of work that unpacks the emotional architecture of a legal meeting, of a jurisdictional overlap, like uh, occurs often in the work of John Burroughs, or for example, of a treaty. The study of emotion seems pertinent to those who are working to recover and call attention to those sensibilities towards law or governance that have long been ignored or actively dismissed or violently dismantled. And a wonderful recent example is a piece by Sarah Mason Case on the black abolitionist Mary Ann Shield, which occurs in Immy Talgren's new edited volume on the forgotten women in international law. So uh, as the first part of this presentation aimed to show, there are several reasons why those studying law might need to be interested in emotion. With respect to each of the broad programs that I've just sketched out of study, it will also be important to consider how one is conceptualizing the reach, range, and recognition of emotion over time and place, including our ability to study emotions, our aptitude for recognizing our own emotions and those of others, and also underlying assumptions about emotions and knowledge claims. So in the second part of the presentation, I will aim to sketch out two series of questions raised by the literature on the philosophy of emotion to suggest that how one sets about to examine emotions in the law will answer and largely depend on how one has formed their idea of emotions in the first place. So to begin, questions of reach and questions of capture. The first set of questions is already raised through the exercise of writing about emotions. What about emotions is it possible to capture through writing and study? What about emotions is it possible to capture in the writing and study of law? There's a really memorable scene, I think, in Mihal Sebastian's novel for 2000 years, where the protagonist, a young scholar, passes a political march with his friend who is immediately seized by the energy and passion of the crowd before seamlessly joining in. The protagonist also wishes to feel this hot, joyful sol solidarity, but finds himself invariably stuck on the outside of the moment, watching himself as an external observer, analyzing the experience and feeling a heavy distance. To me, the scene raises questions as to whether an emotional state might be capturable or cognizable from the outside, from an outside perspective. And we might wonder how the answer to a question of what might be captured from an outside perspective uh, and 
uh, we might, how we might answer this question and how it might change were we to understand emotions to reflect a politics, a political time, an ethics, or a way of seeing. A related background question concerns whether the research and study of emotions alters them in any way. Can research methods grasp their subject pinned and wriggling to the wall? One criticism of the law and emotions field, I think, that I've raised in my own writings, is its tendency to offer overly rationalized descriptions of emotions, often casting emotions as just other forms of reasons for action in order to render them recognizable to those who study and write about law. But I think real questions remain as to whether emotions have something like an elusive quality and whether they're even well understood by the self. We also might wish to ask in what ways emotions are private and the ways in which they are or are not responsive to reasons in the usual way. Further on the subject of capture, we might ask whether we can study the emotions of legal actors by reference to legal documents, by reference to evidentiary records, legislative speeches, and judgments. And if so, are we studying the emotions of those legal actors, or simply the expression of them, or even the performance of them? We might be looking at the quality of their speech, writing, prose, or something else. What are we to think of documents written in concert, as so many of our judgments are? Or of legal judgments that are aiming to capture the ear of the public or to escape the eye of the appellate court? Whose emotions? How and when does legal language even reveal them? Now, philosophers of emotion have long puzzled through questions about emotions and time. Often assumptions about the expected duration of, a mom of an emotion for good or ill serve as stamps of authentication. Is it grief without the long drift? Is it anger without flint? And so too, how emotions change when we fold experiences, including emotional experiences with narratives, drawing in patterns and political histories. We can think very well, for an example, of a time where an incident frightened us, but upon reflection, it rose laughter within us, or on reflection of a broader political history, perhaps, that related to that incident, rose rage, indignation, or anger. On the subject of time and emotion, Susan Bandis, who is a wonderful scholar in this area, has written of how the emotion of remorse implicates something of a future gaze and a promise of better behavior before finding, devastatingly, that judges are often less apt at reading a concrete future full of family, success, and education for poor and racialized defendants, and he hence less likely to attribute to them the emotion of remorse, which is a factor that has serious consequences in sentencing hearings. The above sets of questions the above sets of questions concerned what might be possible to capture about emotions in the theory and practice of law. But this second series of questions concerns the recognition of others through emotions themselves. Which emotions, for example, facilitate recognition, respect, justice, dignity, solidarity, under which circumstances and how might we conceptualize our, um, or examine one's range of emotional concern or the politics and quality of one's emotional concern or the barriers to emotional concern? Robert Solomon describes some emotions as having an intersubjective focus, meaning that they aim at an understanding that sits somewhere between the other and the self. Solomon offers pity as an example of what he means by this intersubjective understanding of emotions. And he uses it to sort of paint when ill versions 
of an emotion might occur. For example, if we focus on pity, if the emotion moves too close to the self, it risks becoming something like narcissistic or self-indulgent if the pain moves too close to the self. But if it moves too far away from the self, the suffering of another might fail to register as it might or should have, causing one at times to be obtuse, heedless, hard-hearted, or cruel. So these are deep and penetrating questions in this uh, second series, especially, I think. So one way to get at them, I think, and I hope, on account of time without too much scaffolding, is to rely on a book of poems by a Ukrainian-American poet, Ilya Kaminsky. Ilya Kaminsky's Deaf Republic is an epic series of 58 poems about a fictionalized town under occupation whose people take up deafness, conceptualized here as a meaning-rich, power-filled refusal of sound, not a lack, as a mode of political resistance. In an early poem, Deafness and Insurgency Begins, a member of an occupying force barks an order at one of the citizens, who raises a finger to her ear, signaling a message not received, a refusal. The image is of incommensurability as resistance, a communication blockade. The image slips and circulates through the whole book of poems, and it raises pressing questions about the roles emotions play in the political recognition of others. Or, spun around, how political realities can work to limit an emotion's range. <clears throat> the unforgettable lyrical prelude to Kaminsky's book of poems is entitled we lived happily during the war. And when they bombed other people's houses, we protested, but not enough. We opposed them, but not enough. In the street of money, in the city of money, in the country of money, our great country of money, we forgive us. We lived happily during the war. The poem points to the wrongness or betrayal of living happily amidst great suffering, or more directly, even at the expense of others' suffering. It concerns the failure to respond emotionally where one has political or moral reasons to do so. Since Aristotle, we've had the idea that we can share in another's pain. Mill wrote about this. Martha Nussbaum has written extensively about this. Often this is the cursory definition of empathy that we are given. We share in another's pain but we also have sociologists of punishment who've detailed the long history of witnessing pain without experiencing pain. And we have Simone Weil in her article, The Iliad or the Poem of Force, who illustrates the great difficulty, the ethic of witnessing pain without feeling either titillation or nothingness. And so the question arises, must a recognition of kinship or equality always precede the sharing of another's pain? Or might the witnessing of another's pain instigate or facilitate the recognition of kinship or equality that's deserved? Notice this is such a critical sequencing question. Lynn Hunt has argued the latter position suggesting that over time, literary depictions of pain and suffering have worked to generate more inclusive conceptions of justice through empathy. Hans Joas resists this view by citing historical examples to illustrate how the pain of the other remains unseen and unaffecting prior to the recognition that they are somehow politically sacred or politically equal. These views needn't be mutually exclusive. But the productive potential of emotions in the law rests on the sequencing of pain and recognition that an emotion is presumed to entail. As the poem suggests, the absence of an appropriate emotion or the presence of an inappropriate one 
is evidence of an ethical error or even a cognitive error. At times, painful emotions serve epistemic functions, aiding our understanding of the situation we are confronting. Emotional reactions such as horror, indignation, or political anger can serve to highlight the hypocritical nature of a legal regime by juxtaposing the impacts of a law's publicly stated aims with the fallout, the impact. It's important to note, however, the attention directing features of emotions are far from apolitical, and they raise a series of questions about whose emotions are legible to those in power and whose emotions are perceived to be legitimate, compound, deeply felt, or authentic. This is a further poem in the book. In this stage of the poem, there is much violence in the fictional town. There have been disappearances. And the narrator writes these lines to emphasize this small circle of his emotional concern. Significantly here, the poem illustrates how one's range of emotional concern might be impacted by material and political realities and so too political violence. This raises an additional series of questions concerning how one's range of emotional concern might be extended and the ways they might be extended in line with one's own political or ethical or justice-based commitments. What are the effective aspects of solidarity? What is the difference between an emotion-soaked witness and voyeurism? Are there material, political, legal, constitutional prerequisites for, feeling, for feelings associated with equality and dignity? Within the field of law and emotion, it's a long abandoned view that emotions are beyond judgment or political evaluation, though this is often the stated rationale for the call to disentangle legal reasoning and emotion. The final poem in Kaminsky's book <clears throat> sees the fictionalized occupied town left by the narrator for present day America. The poem is t entitled In a Time of Peace. A section that you have before you reads, ours is a country in which a boy shot by police lies on the, lies on the pavement for hours. We see in his open mouth the nakedness of the whole nation. We watch, watch, others watch. The body of a boy lies on the pavement exactly like the body of a boy. The poem, as I understand it, is referring to the police shooting of an unarmed black teenager, Michael Brown, and the grave dishonor and disregard shown from the act of letting his lifeless body lie on the pavement for hours as the surrounding community gathered to give witness. Brown is not mentioned by name in the poem, and nor is his town of Ferguson, Missouri. As one reads the poem, the reference is either known or not known. And one final question for today is what turns on this? The poetic ambiguity of the image raises a question long grappled with in the study of history, in the study of the history of political thought, and so too with respect to the history of the philosophy of mind and knowledge, which is how much context and detail is required for understanding. We might ask here after the role of detail in constructing affect, what is necessary to know to share in the rage and the mourning called for by the allusion to this killing in this poem? What details impact the shape of this rage and this mourning, or the duration of this rage and this mourning? What is lost in broad comparative work, and what is gained? Well, I'm just getting wound up, and as you might uh, have noticed, I could speak about this subject for hours, but I think it's a little past time for me to stop. So I'll just say this. Many of the questions I've used emotions to pose today are overwhelmingly large. 
implicating whole systems of knowledge, philosophies of action, philosophies of mind, theories of history, theories of human nature, and so on. Nevertheless, I believe we must ask them. We must ask them because our answers to these questions, however buried or explicit, have been setting our terms and frames and associations for the legal research, which always follows. Thank you. So I want to all thank you for coming and also <laughs> join me in thanking Dr. Emily Kidwhite for giving this very fascinating lecture. Thank you all.